Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. And I'm here with Luke Simons, like diamonds. <laughs> That's a week like diamonds, dude. Well, I know. People complain. We had some people complain at the <laughs> New Year's. They said, oh, we don't like the high pitch like diamonds. Get rid of it completely. So you guys tell me what you like. Do you like just the Joe Simons or Joe Simons like diamonds or Joe Simons like diamonds or Joe Simons like diamonds? <laughs> <laughs> It's funny, and so for those of you who hate that, I, it, honestly, it bugs me. I, mean, I got to wear, th- th- I got to put throat drops in every day. It's such a high pitch; it kills my throat. But I, I stopped doing the like diamonds quite some. This is a few years ago. You know, people on uh, Facebook and YouTube like, man, cut out with like diamonds. We've heard it already. Uh, one guy had a really inappropriate comment. I can't repeat on here, and uh, so I stopped it. And then all of a sudden. People started saying, "Hey, I, I kind of miss the like diamonds." And some of the same people that hated it said, "Ah, yeah, I did hate it, but I don't know. It's just kind of catchy, and it got me excited to listen." So uh, I, I'm I'm in a, a quandrum here, a pickle, if you will, on uh, on keeping it. So get, let us know, comment down below about uh, the like diamonds, or maybe just do it, Joe Simon's like diamonds, and just it's nat- maybe more of a natural flow. What do you think about that, Luke? I don't know. I think that that high pitch one is is definitely a love hate relationship. Uh, it, is. it was it was interesting. There were a surprising lot of people that missed it. I personally did not miss it. And what's funny, you've been out in the boat with me many times. This didn't happen once or twice. This is countless times. It happened last week actually. And people will go by us and see the salt strong boat or they recognize us, and they will yell out one of two things: salt strong. Slam shady or like diamonds. It's <laughs> like it happens all the time. And someone just recently uh, did that to me, like like diamonds. Um, so I know it's I know it's catchy and people remember it, uh, which is what it's all about. So uh, anyhow, uh, this is about the ninety ten, not about like diamonds. Um, so if you're not familiar with the ninety ten zone, it essentially means that ninety percent of all the feeding fish can be found in just 10%. So a really small segment or a percentage of that area at any given tide, time of day, et cetera. And Luke, we've taken the drone up. We've proven this. I mean, anyone who's fished enough, all most guides will agree with that. Like, yeah, if you're looking at a any body of water, a, about a, a one small little area is usually where all the fish, the feeding fish at least, are going to be uh, be found. What are, you, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I, I think although this this podcast started with a, a very uh, not very meaningful or important discussion of intro, uh, that's not true at all. Intro quotes. Uh, this this ninety ten principle is extremely important. Uh, they, this literally is the the number one thing that we need to to have in mind. First of all, it's true, right? Most of the fish, especially talking about redfish, sea trout, snook flounder, that they hold in they hold in groups, and they'll usually end up being in and again 90 percent of the fish will be in about 10 percent of the water and so if we don't have that at top of mind when we're out there fishing we're gonna you know statistically we're gonna be most of the time in dead zones in spots without much fish and as long as we're just thinking about okay are there fish here and then especially if you're starting to think about okay why are there not fish here or why should there be some fish in one spot and, and not fishing another based on the conditions and based on the season, that's really where the magic is. So like, like we personally used to just go to the same spots over and over again. And, uh, and we were just, Oh my gosh, like this spot should be good. We caught a bunch of fish here before. Why, why was this terrible? The, the conditions change, like fish move around. And so, um, yeah, just, just focusing on, okay. Am I in a ninety ten zone? Yes or no throughout the day is the most important thing you can do in my opinion. Yeah, you nailed it. The 9010 zone, the great news is that once you find it, you're in the honey hole. That's a honey hole. Bad news is it moves every single day, as Luke said. I mean, so if you fish the same spot over and over again, it will be the 9010 zone every once in a while. It just won't always be the 9010 zone, assuming it's got the right amount of structure and bait for certain trends. And so if you aren't in the 9010 zone, as Luke said, your chances of getting skunked and going home looking like a knucklehead and going home with your head held low or going back to the ramp and hoping and praying that no one asks you how the day went or having to go back to a spouse that says, hey, I gave you the hall pass. How many fish did you catch? And all you can say is it was an exploration day. No one likes that. And so we're going to talk a lot about this 9010 zone, really the, the truth about how critical this is. And Luke, you did a video recently I saw for our Insider members, and you know, you kind of teased that, guys, it, it, no matter how expensive your boat is or your 
eighty thousand dollar skiff or how many power prawns and slam shadies and mulligans or whatever lures and bait you're into you could have the liveliest live well in the world if you aren't fishing in the 90 10 zone your chances of catching fish are really slim and we have this quote up here paul johnson if you've ever read the scientific angler it's kind of like the the bible on uh on on fishing and it, you know, he was more into, into bass fishing but everyone uh who is uh, serious about fishing uh, you know, has read this book or, or heard bits and pieces of it. And Paul Johnson was famous for going underwater, scuba, scuba diving, that is, and actually filming all of this to document it. And he's documenting everything from colors and what colors do underwater to to really studying what fish do in their mm-hmm. own environment. It's easy to say, oh, here's what we found on a drone or here's where we caught fish. But, you know, he learned so much just from going underwater and being still in, in filming this. And so here's what he says. If you're listening, if you're watching, you can read it yourself. But it says, in, in uh, any given body of water of which I've dived, less than 10% of the underwater acreage has held 90% of the game fish population. All too often, the fisherman has absolutely no clue that he has cruised by some of the finest fishing areas he could imagine in his wildest dreams. And uh, if you've read the book, you know some of the stories. I mean, he's gone down there and and watched his boats pull up in spots that he's down there and, you know, just 15 or so feet of water. And he's down kind of nearby and he sees the bass and the fishermen will fish it for a while and then leave. And, uh, you know, above the water, they're saying, oh, man, this area doesn't doesn't have anything. And in that case, they might have had the, the wrong lures or not 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 even knowing exactly where they were. But he's like so many times they were so close to where all these feeding fish were and yet so far away and they just left and had no idea how close they were to to an actual honey hole so uh look we and, and this is a presentation if you guys are wondering what these slides are for uh this is actually a a, a webinar that we're working on uh, for our, our members just to go into even more clarity on this because once you get this everything else becomes easier or irrelevant right luke yeah, and, and it's one thing to know kind of like what area to go to. And uh, another part of it, too, that a lot of people overlook is is even, you know, once you're in a good spot, is the actual depth that the fish are holding. And, and so I, I, the reason I bring it up is I I just I, I saw some comments that uh, or I saw a comment from a, uh, a subscriber who was saying that he went to this area and it wasn't really catching anything. And I just asked, okay, what we're using and like what what were the conditions like? And he was fishing a 10 foot hole, um, which is which is actually really smart for the winter time. Um, and it had like it had structure and everything. It had all the, you know, the kind of the the core types of stuff you should look for in the winter. But he was using a lure, like a, a soft plastic rigged on a weighted hook, which no matter it's really tough to fish that in 10 feet of water. It's gonna hold up higher in the water column. So likely there were a ton of fish at the bottom where they're supposed to be, like where they naturally will usually gravitate in the winter. And he just didn't have a lure that was getting down deep enough. He was just going over the top of them. So it, in many cases, we're actually getting ourselves in pretty good spots. We're just not using the right gear to actually attract them and, and get their attention. So it's it's more, it's, it's uh, you know, we need to think about geographically where are we, but we also need to think about the the water column, like right? what areas of the water column those fish are. And just a, just an easy tip for winter, which is where we're at as we're filming this, it's almost always on the bottom. Most of the feeding activity happens on the bottom. So if you're not bouncing bottom or like feeling the bottom on like on literally every cast, you're probably not fishing deep enough. You're probably you probably need to add some more weight uh, or or choose a different lure that can get down a little bit deeper. Just want to throw that out there. Cool. All right. Well, so let, let's talk about that. We're in winter as we're filming this. It's chilly. I got a got a hoodie on. What do you do to put yourself in the 9010 zone? I know you were just in Marco Island last week, the week before you were in Port Charlotte. You caught fish both times. W- what did you do differently that the people who are struggling to consistently catch fish here? Let's just let's just go with the winter. What did you do in those areas that you don't live in? Uh, what did you do pre-trip planning? What did you do when you got there? What pivots did you make? Love to hear it. Well, uh, I mean, really, it was just, I mean, it was thinking about 90-10 recipe, really. Like I know, but how did just, you find that 90-10 zone? 
so uh, there's there's a recipe and we will go through it in detail we, we have a survey that we just came out with that goes through the recipe in detail it's um it'll probably it's probably a little bit too long to do in this podcast yeah let's but, let's, let's tell them where that is if you're an insider member we already gave this to you but if you're not uh we put together a, a really cool recipe where we get on satellite maps it's, it's going to be a whole lot more in depth than this so if we wouldn't even mind if you just skip the rest of this podcast and go there right now and uh, opt in. We actually give you a customized one for your state. So you'll actually get to see us getting on maps or really Luke getting on maps in your state and showing how he uses this recipe to find honey holes. And it's saltstrong.com forward slash recipe. That'll take you right there. So saltstrong.com forward slash recipe. Once again, if you're already an insider member, you don't need to go there. It's already there. It's a whole mini course we put together for you guys. Uh, but if you're not an insider member, maybe you're on the fence and you want to say, I, I want to see more about what these guys are talking about. Go there now uh, you or stick around to the end. But it's a uh, saltstrong.com forward slash recipe. So certain interrupt there, but I, I know that some people probably just want to go there now. Yeah, again, that's the number one thing to think about. So if you're if you're not consistent and catching fish during the winter, that is a must watch lesson. It is crucially important. I used to think that winter time, the, the bite was tough. That uh, after cold front would come through, I like I wasn't going to go fishing. Right, this fish, I used to eat, use the term lockjaw. Yeah, and uh, now that's that term is totally bogus. Get that out of your vocabulary. If, if you're struggling with with catching fish during uh, any time, but especially during the winter, it's not because the fish are are lockjaw. Right, maybe maybe if there's a, like a crazy freeze where there's actually some like fish on the brink of of dying, that obviously they won't bite then. But even when the when the weather gets down in the 50s here in, in Florida, there's still some really good bites happening as long as you find that 90-10 zone. And uh, be, because fish, right, they have to eat. Right? They can't just sit there and not eat. Yes, when they get cold, they're going to get a little bit more lethargic and they're they're certainly not going to chase down a topwater lure. But but even if they're lethargic and you just get an easy little meal right in front of their face, their instinct is to eat, right? I mean, they're, their brains are tiny, they're not thinking, they're not down there thinking much. And they'll, they'll start just naturally moving um, based on the change of the environment. That's basically all they do. And then if they see an easy meal and their life isn't on the line, they're going to eat it. And, and so it's really as simple as that. So the cool thing about winter, once you get good and, and practice and, and see multiple instances of this 90, 10 recipe, um, you know, being applied and being used is when you can find the, the, this, this 90, 10 zone, we'll call it it's amazing like all oh, there's so many fish there in the winter time they, they hold in bunches so in the winter time i almost call it the the 95 five zone where like 95 percent of the fish are in five percent of the water so yes it, it's going to be more likely especially people who aren't paying attention they're going to have less odds of actually catching fish because there's just that much smaller part of the water that all the fish are holding in but for those who can find the good spots the rewards are incredible yeah, absolutely incredible. Regardless of where you are, I mean, again, Joe mentioned I've been traveling up and down uh, Florida, and and it applies there. Uh, we have Wyatt, like Wyatt, even as a, uh, a a relatively new angler, started applying these lessons to North Carolina when he was living there, and he would find some pockets, these small pockets up in the inland creeks, and have a field day with fish. I mean, some of these, some of the one video he caught like fifty reds. It was just absolute field day because he applied this principle, this 90, 10 recipe principle and applied it to the, to the, uh, to the environment. So, uh, as far as like the, the one thing that, uh, to answer your question, Joe, the one thing that, that really led me to the feeding zones, the, these really this, this, this past few weeks and has done so in consistently consistently is to, is to just think about, okay, what are fish worried about? Or I guess what are fish feeling in the winter months that, that drive them to make, to take action? Right. So again, fish aren't thinking their brains are tiny, but their body is, is going to, is going to push them to do certain things. Yeah. They don't think they, times. they react to the environment. Basically. Yeah. Fish are not smart at all. All they're doing is they're reacting to the change of their environment based on what their body is motivating them to do. So when the winter months, right, it's going to be cold, it's colder than normal. And so fish will naturally not feel comfortable due to that. And the fact that they're cold blooded, they can't moderate their temperature like we can. So their only way to feel better is to start swimming and, and, and start swimming until they start finding some warm pockets of water. And so literally all I've been doing, whether I'm fishing areas that I've fished my whole life, or if I'm traveling and fishing somewhere I've never been to, to before, like I did last week, 
down in uh, down in the Everglades, I'm literally all I'm trying to do is okay, where are the warm pockets of water, right? So and say the, the 200 yard span that looks pretty good on maps. Okay, where like where are the small little pockets of water that are going to be just slightly warmer than everywhere else? And and another thing too, I I, I see it happen all the time that I I think is a big mistake is so many people rely on the on the temperature gauge of their of their boat right of their of their uh of their depth finder unit i mean yes that's kind of helpful but i don't really care at all what the temperature is in the winter months i don't care much at all what the temperature is like a foot and a half down which is where that that transducer is i want to know what the depth what the temperature is on the bottom yeah and, and i don't i'm not looking for like a eight degree difference i just want to just like a fraction of a degree difference that's where those fish are going to be they can feel it if you go in the water uh, and, and you, you can feel a slight change in the temperature, you know it. And these, these fish know it, right? They're surrounded by water. And so all we need is it's better to just think about the, what fosters heat or, or at least uh, what prevents cold from getting to certain areas. Thinking about that is more important, in my opinion, than, than constantly looking at the temperature gauge of a boat. Because, again, we're not trying to find like the lowest degree and like uh, where i'm tampa bay right now so my goal when i go out in tampa bay i'm not trying to find the the warmest area around the entire bay the entire tampa bay i want to find okay if i'm fishing a little creek or a cove i want to know the warmest pocket in that cove or in that creek right regardless of what's happening on the other side of tampa bay, i can care less those fish aren't going to travel 20 miles they'll use they'll just kind of move around and shift around in their general area that they're holding and they're going to push up and they're going to hold in the in the spots that are just slightly warmer than everywhere else and so again that that alone was the biggest game changer for my for my winter time my winter time game and so so lately uh the the factor uh, one of the biggest factors i would say the biggest factor is is depth is water depth and and, and just you know again just thinking logically you know fish don't like to be cold they don't like to be overly cold and overnight when the temperatures are the coldest the the cold air is impacting the water and so basically all the shallows like obviously the, the air is impacting water from the top down so all the shallows basically get zapped overnight and and i used to my mistake years ago is i would go to my my like favorite flats after a cold front and be oh man like be surprised i didn't catch anything <laughs> and uh in reality those flats were really cold overnight and those fish bailed they didn't feel good. They're they're bailing. They're just swimming around till they find something warmer. Going to deeper water. And, and where they'll go is deeper water. But you need to find deep water with structure, right? So they're not they're not just going to sit out in the middle of a channel and on sand because now they're going to be easy pickings for a dolphin or shark or whatever is coming by. So the 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 key and what I've literally all I've been doing is just looking for in whatever area I'm fishing, I want to find the deepest structure I can possibly find. And so like down, down the Everglades, it was just going into the creeks, into, into the channels and, and just look at the map on like where I could, I could pull up a map, but I was, I was basically looking on the map where current was like hitting up against the shoreline, knowing that that's going to dig a deep trough. And I was looking for spots that were like 10 feet or more. And literally we, we went for, to five spots and we had action in all five spots. It was, it was literally that simple. And especially when we got a deep hole with structure and we could have caught as many trout as we wanted to and the ladyfish were so bad it was actually a nuisance but but long but there was just life right the 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 life will naturally gravitate towards those warm pockets of water and so we weren't using the depth finder to find that we are i was using our our uh actually our smart fishing spots platform where you can actually see the uh you know the bottom contour and then on on the almost it kind of looks like navionics type type map and then you can also quickly switch over to the satellite view where you can look for trees and look for above the water type structure that that comes up against the deep pockets. So that was it. Like, and it was shockingly effective. And so you said number one is depth. I assume number two is is probably wind because of that. You're, you're trying to find some wind protected areas as well. Yeah, but I mean, if it's super cold and and they get in like ten feet of water, the wind, the wind isn't that big of a deal. They just because because we're talking ten feet of water. Like even if it's wavy, that's not going to be that much of a determining factor down deep. 
So the, like after a front in particular, I'm just looking for deep water and like, and I had a good trip in, uh, in, in Boca Grande recently. And this was after a severe cold front, like that one right after Christmas. And I, I went to this area and it was the spot that I've known. So I, I wasn't using a map on this one because I just knew the spot, but there was this, there's this really big bay. That's all about like, I don't know, three to like one feet of water. And it has a lot of structure, like during the summer and fall, it's great because there's going to be, there's a lot of life up in there, a lot of crustaceans in the grass, usually has a lot of mullet. Um, and then there's one spot, there's like a, a, a nice little constriction zone that all the water has to go in and out of. And so it digs a trough that's about six, seven feet deep. And so that one hole is surrounded by all the shallow water nearby and and after the cold front, I was like, okay, I know there's, I know this bay holds a lot of life and I know that it's been really cold lately. So all that life surely gravitated toward that hole. And, and the answer was yes. And we had a good day there. So, um, and so it's not, it's not like you have to find a certain depth or a certain water temperature. It's you just need to find somewhere that's again, slightly deeper than everywhere else, or just slightly warmer than everywhere else. And that's where those fish are going to be. Cool. Yeah. While you, uh, you know, pull up the map, one of the, uh, one of the things that helped me a lot, and I think Luke, you might've told me this was when you're looking in a new area on like, let's just say a satellite map, in instead of just trying to find the honey hole, the 90, 10 zone, sometimes it makes more sense to eliminate stuff first. And, yeah. and what I mean by that, right. Is all right because it, it, it can be overwhelming at times when you look at a, this like this like this isn't if, if you're listening luke's got a massive body of water pull up in the big scheme of things if you're a kayak and it take y'all day to explore this and so it can be overwhelming so instead of just like trying to pinpoint and maybe you get overwhelmed by man, I, I'm, I'm struggling to find this 90 tens that luke's talking about start just eliminating stuff that you know for sure is not it right i mean just like if you were trying to find one pin like a needle in a in a haystack start you know ripping off the stuff that you know where, where it's not and so you can get down to some maybe hey these are a couple little clobs that they uh they might be in uh to me that made it a whole lot easier uh so luke you got the map up now what are we looking at yeah so this is a satellite view of of an area and, and this is just kind of just this is the power of technology really this is just and, and just just how helpful this is is, is just mind-blowing just stuff I just wish I had access to earlier. Yeah. But this is this is a a map, and as you can see, this is a satellite picture. It wasn't really taken during the best time, so you can't see a whole lot of underwater stuff. Um, you can tell, you know, we can see there's some shallows right here, like some shallow marsh type stuff. Given that it's, you can see some darkness. You can see that it's some some sort of shallow bottom with dark, um, either grass or mud on it, but. Once it gets down to maybe one or two feet, you can't see anything. And so the cool thing about technology, and this is this is smart fishing spots. This is a platform that we set up for our Insider Club members. And you can actually toggle from different maps, which is awesome. So I'll go from the Bing satellite that we're looking at now to this high res view. Whoa. And now this is a night and day difference. So now we can actually see much better, you know, with much more clarity. Okay, yes, this looks like some nice seagrass. You can even see this boat just kind of running around the edge of that seagrass going up to the shallower water. And so very helpful. You can see that there's, you know, see more details in the channels. And so that's extremely helpful, right? For that, that prior view to this view is night and day. Mm -hmm. But so this is great for the, for the summer months where a lot of the fish are, are holding up shallow. And now we can kind of, you know, zoom around and see, okay, where are some nice, nice little shallow pockets that, that have some current flow, right? You can kind of basically, you can see everything you need on a satellite view for the most part for summer spots. During the winter, we're looking for, in any given area, we want to find that that deep stuff, right? After these cold fronts come in, we, we want to know, okay, where do these fish, where are the fish in this area? Where do they naturally move to when these cold fronts push in? And it's the deep water. And so a feature that we added on here, um, which is again, a game changer, is this marine chart. And so let me uh, let me get this puppy going here. But what this will do is this will, if it decides to work, <laughs> it's not decided not to work today. But what this, what this has been doing is, uh, is it actually show the actual water depth 
and it happened to break as we're doing this video <laughs> sure i wonder if you got the wrong satellite up or something because mine was uh or if you're down too low mine was just working uh let's see i was literally did this yesterday at this spot for a lesson that's, that's crazy funny. take take the what satellite view off or down yeah what i'll do is i'll uh i'll reset it no, and but... see if... what's that okay yeah, but uh, I guess while let me let me uh, take it off so figure it out. But but what what this will show is this will show that basically this entire area is like three to five feet of water, and then we have like some thirteen foot ranges, some twelve, some eights pushing through this channel right here. Guess where those fish are going to be in? Right, they're going to be right here in this channel. And uh, let me let me give you uh, give you the screen and see if I can fix this puppy. I um, love technology. Well, I had mine on my phone um, just here a little while ago, and it was working. But anyhow, I mean, what Luke, what my friend here is trying to say is that love is blind. <laughs> uh, no, what he's saying is, I mean, it, it's uh, it, it's showing sonar. I mean, you literally get to see all the depth, every single area, and uh, man, it it almost feels like cheating when you can combine that, and then you start looking, uh, you know, for areas that have structure, like we have the oyster bars and the seagrass there it is uh, it's back on yeah so i just, just had, to had a, little, it. a little glitch there yeah i had to reset it so so now we're looking at and let me just toggle over so you can see that we're in the same spot so we're in that same spot and and again the cool thing about this is you can toggle back and forth so i can say okay i want to see the depths i want to i want to pinpoint these and deep pockets 12 and, and 13 over there in that little cut yeah and so in this whole area you can see a lot of zeros twos ones and this is just total marsh uh, but we have this one channel, right? 8, 12, 13, 11. And then we can zoom in and start just on, okay, like we can see there's some legit depths coming through. And another really cool thing is I, I mentioned before is we need the deep water with structure. So deep water is great, but ideally we need to find some deep water with structure. And then we have this oyster feature. My personal favorite structure to look for is oysters uh, because it holds life and it's it's just great protection from uh from dolphins so we have this oyster feature where i just hit that on there and now the oysters show up in bright white so you can actually see where the oysters are and then ideally look for areas that have oysters that go out into the deeper water you know any kind of structure really but in this case we have some docks we have the oysters coming out here. This is just like a textbook type of spot to look for, where it's the deepest pocket of water that also has the, some good structure nearby, multiple forms of structure. So this is like the perfect textbook type thing to look for. So after cold front, I'm going to be bouncing small jigs right up along the shoreline and, and out to the deep water around these docks and everything, because that's where the fish are going to be. Mm -hmm. and and it's it's important to fish very slowly in the winter those fish are not going to be chasing down lures so having a good pre-trip plan is crucial because that way you can just go to a spot like this knowing that okay i, I can't cover a ton of water so i need to i need to maximize my time in the, in the best zones possible and just slowly fish th these spots and i'd be shocked if there weren't a lot of fish caught along these along these docks in the winter that's just one piece of the recipe, right? So just just no, just knowing part of the recipe is huge in itself, especially if you have some uh, you know some some technology to help to help you know help you really see the the best spots. So are those little barrier islands with houses on them, like little, yeah, uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. Isn't it? Yeah, it's cool. So you can only get there by boat, and um, man, that's a that's a cool little set. They got their own little islands, basically. Yep. Not so cool during hurricane season, but uh yes, this this spot's actually over in Texas. Every other time that is a uh, that is awesome. Yep, but uh yeah, so again, but there's and there's the cool thing about this is that it's not like okay, I, let, me, let me find this spot. I'm gonna look at this map and study every bit of it and find find this spot. There's a million spots like this all around the coastline. So it's not about trying to find one spot in particular. It's just it's just get the recipe right, take the survey, get the recipe, and then apply it to literally whichever body of water you're fishing. This isn't a, a, a one thing you might find like one spot in Tampa Bay that matches it or one spot in Sarasota or wherever you're fishing. There's going to be a ton of spots and they'll change as the wind changes, as the 
as we're trending warmer or trending cooler, um, you know, the fish move. And, and that recipe will just help make sure that you predict, that you accurately predict, you know, what the fish are going to be doing given the conditions so that you can maximize your time in the in the feeding zones and, and not waste your time in those dead zones. That's awesome. I'm curious what lure are you using like power prawn on a, on a jig head yeah. in these deeper areas or what? Yeah. I mean, right now the, the power prawn and, and the power prawn junior is, in particular has been my go-to. It's been most right. That's literally what I've been catching all the best fish with lately and, and bouncing slowly on the bottom. And many times in the winter, the, the, the prey are, are getting small. Uh, there's gonna be less bait fish in the area and and just shrimp seem to just be, be a, a good popular food source and, and it's pretty easy for fish to catch and so just a slow bounce on the bottom and the fact that that these fish are holding their structure i don't have the the jig head here in front of me but we have this this new football jig it's a weedless football jig that we actually designed for the power prawns and so it's a football shape and it helps make sure that when that shrimp lands on the bottom its tail stays up and that it can't wobble, right? It can't wobble back and forth. So it'll sit there nice and natural. So when you bounce the bottom and hold it, this, this shrimp will kind of settle down just like it does naturally and then bounce up to the next one. And it drives the fish crazy because it's just, they're, they're there, right? You, you put yourself, you put it in a good spot. And then as you do a slow little bounce right in front of their face, they're going to eat it, right? It's the, their natural instinct is to strike. They see an easy meal and it looks natural. It has motion that that resembles how they naturally move they're going to eat it and so it's called the hoss weedless football jig the core ounce has been my go-to but if i'm fishing the the deepest pockets that are more than say 12 to 12 15 feet actually more than 10 feet of water i'll often go to the half ounce the half ounce size um one trick if if you get into a spot and there's a lot of ladyfish which uh which is often the case because those you know ladyfish will they, they're they're cold as well they're going to gravitate toward the warm pockets. Uh, we got this spot down in the Everglades where there was, it was like literally ladyfish hitting every cast. Like they were a nuisance and the trout were down the bottom below them. And so I was like, I'm just going to try not to catch a ladyfish. And so I'm, I'm using this lure, uh, made a cast out. And instead of bouncing on the bottom, which I normally do as we bounce it, right. Those ladyfish are usually a little bit higher and they're, they're more likely to see it on the bounce. So I just slowly dragged it across, almost like like a, like worm fishing for bass. Do you remember that? We would just like slow crawl those big worms. And I would just slow crawl the, the power funnel on the bottom. And I caught trout every time I did it. And no ladyfish. Mm. So I thought that was a little, little ladyfish prevention trick is to just drag slow on the bottom. Because that would, just the slow drag is actually surprisingly effective for trout, redfish, snook. Um, you don't have to bounce. Yeah, you know, I, I was up in Georgia for New Year's and uh it, it got cold this year. I mean, that Christmas and a couple of days after Christmas, you know, it was down in the in the teens. I mean, it got below 20 that one day, and then the next day was at 20. So the water got cold. And, you know, the water's crystal clear. And we're, you know, fishing lakes uh, up there. And I had the power prawn junior on that same Hoss uh helix, or not Hoss Helix, the Hoss uh jig head, the smaller one. And I'm watching, I could see all the way down on the bottom and I'm watching what was happening. And so I'd cast, I'd let it hit the bottom. And then I would just do that rod tip shake. So I'm not reeling, I'm not popping. Uh, I'm almost kind of dragging it, but just kind of shaking it and that, and that thing. And they'd all, all the bass, cause they are, they're, they're not hitting top waters in the, in the winter. They're all down at the bottom, by the way. So, I mean, I could s literally see pockets of bass all at the bottom and they would all kind of come up and like, almost kind of look at it and explore it. Like, what is this thing? And then the second I would get one, I'd keep shaking it. And one would finally, like one would always be like the, the brave one to come up and kind of get real close to it. And I just barely move it, like barely drag it. And that's when they would attack it every time. The second it, that it started trying to go away from them, they couldn't resist it. They would literally, and we had so much fun doing that. We caught bass till we were tired. And most of it was like that. But had I done big pops, they they were just almost kind of too lazy and lethargic to go for it. But if I just did nice and slow, they'd kind of slowly come over to it. And as long as there was some movement, uh, it, it was it was. And then I could recreate that. And there was a couple of deeper areas where I couldn't see the bottom, and I would just recreate that, and just kept, it kept working over and over again. It was really cool. Yeah, and that, that's the. It was interesting too uh, how just totally different species react the same way. So I was um, 
live on a canal and I was trying to get footage of sheep's head eating a shrimp. I've always, I still haven't, I still haven't got a sheep that I've had a ton of other species, but mangrove snapper in particular, I'll have a live shrimp on the bottom with it, with a GoPro right in front of it. And obviously I'm, I like leave it. I just leave it there for an hour and a half and recording, but in almost all instances, the snapper will just investigate the shrimp and the shrimp's holding on the bottom. But as soon as that shrimp twitches, literally like a fraction of a second, as soon as that shrimp moves, that snapper hammers it. And so all, it just takes out that little trigger. And, and so as Joe mentioned, that's very smart to do some sort of rod move. But even dragging the bottom, you know, as long as you're in a good spot, there's some structure there. And so as you're dragging the bottom, you're eventually going to hit a rock or something. And it's going to hold up, hold up, and then just kind of bump off of it. That's when those strikes will happen. So, so yeah, just be mindful of, okay, what are these fish doing? Um, slower, the better in the winter time, And the colder it is, the slower you go. Um, but during the, the, the warm periods in between the fronts, if we have like four days or five days of warmth of nice sunny weather, then those fish will start pushing up onto some nearby shallows. So, so basically what I look for, what the recommendation would be to find some deep pockets, right? Very important that also have structure, but ideally those deep pockets are close to some good shallow, some shallow zones with structure because after four days of, of good sunshine, then that sun is now warming up those shallows to the point where now that water is warmer than the deep pockets that they were seeking shelter in during the cold snap. So those fish, they're, they're constantly trying to find, okay, where I'm, where am I going to be as comfortable as possible? And, and so as the, after a few days of warmth, those fish will naturally start moving up shallower. So just keep that in mind too, where you're, when you're, when you're selecting your, your spots that don't worry so much about the absolute temperature because a, a, a water in 60 degrees, like a fish in 60 degrees could could have two totally different perceptions of 60 degrees. If they just came from 55, 60 degrees feels amazing, right? They're going to be super happy. But if it was just 60, if it was just 65 and went down to 60, now they're cold and, and not happy and very lethargic. So it's not so much the absolute number, it's the it's the movement. Is it getting warmer or is it getting colder? As it's getting warmer, they're getting happier. Um, they'll, they'll be a little bit more aggressive Then, as it's getting cooler. They're going to not be so happy. They're going to be very, they're going to be less aggressive, but either way, they're still going to be feeding. If there's an easy meal in front of their face, they're going to eat it. And so don't do what I did for many years. I was, I just avoided, um, fishing after cold fronts. Now I love it because now I know as long as I find that 90, 10 zone, I'm going to have a ton of fish to target and likely catch a bunch of fish in one spot without having to move around. So um, that was the biggest lesson I learned over the last like 10 years as just wintertime fishing can be awesome. Even if it's, there's a severe cold front, as long as those fish aren't precariously cold. Cool. That's awesome. Hope you guys loved this. Two things to do next. One is to go to fishstrong.com and get yourself some power prawns and these hoss uh, hooks and jig heads uh, load up on them. Luke just did a video on our YouTube channel, explaining the difference of all the different hoss jig heads and weighted hooks so that you know which one to get. Uh, but yeah, that's all over at fishstrong.com. And as we said earlier, go to saltstrong.com forward slash recipe to get your 90 10 recipe for your area. It's completely free. Uh, this is really for non insiders, just, you know, being in Canada, the insiders already have this. It's part of a mini course, as I said earlier. But if you're uh, not an insider, you're on the fence and, and you just want more of this and really want to dial in the 90 10 zone in all seasons, not just winter, then uh, go to saltstrong.com forward slash recipe and uh, tell us where you are and we'll shoot that sucker over to you. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, and so if you all remember, the, um, it's it's the just the the mini course came out recently. Um, so you can go to the fishing tip section and just use that search bar. That that search bar, you can really find everything you need. Yeah. In that search bar, just type ninety dash ten, and then you'll and that'll pop up. And it's super yeah. quick search and check it out. You'll you'll see you have full access to all of them. Um, I would say just pick pick your state and and you'll be able to see some some localized intel um, to really and just show examples of exactly what to look for. So that you can you can just have the best odds as possible of of finding those ninety ten zones, and obviously you know our, our weekly insider reports and game plan lessons will give you the 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 recipe in action over time as well, right? So so we're going to continually be showing this because this is going to be in effect for at least the next few months. Yeah. Um, so so as you get better and better, it's this wintertime fishing is is an absolute blast.
Love it. All right, guys, you know what to do next. Go to fishdraw.com, get your tackle, and then go to saltstraw.com forward slash recipe if you're not a member and get your 90-10 recipe for your state. Otherwise, we will talk to you on the next episode. Peace. We out. See you.